All right, hi everybody, it's a great pleasure to be here. So today's class number four is on databases and algorithms. So I'll start with a couple of announcements, uh, quiz matters. So uh, in the quiz of last week, not the one that finished yesterday, but the quiz of last week, there were two questions that were not properly phrased. And so what I've decided to do is to give 0.2% bonus points to all the people who have answered the quiz before I corrected the, uh, the phrasing of these questions. So this won't appear on your quiz results because it's actually very difficult for me to go to <coughs> every question of every person and say, okay, plus zero two. I've got this uh, kind of bag of bonus points, which is called bonus points on your grades page. And whenever things like this happen, I just add bonus points to everybody. It's much simpler for me to do that. So then you won't see the correlation between these bonus points that you get but in principle, they don't necessarily appear right now, but everybody who has submitted their quiz on time uh, has got 0.2 bonus points appearing there. And that's to correct for these two questions that were not super well phrased. Uh, I think most people got, got the point of these questions. You understood what happens and there's no, there's no point going over these questions. They, they were clear just that they were badly phrased on my side. So I didn't want to penalize you because of just the way the question was asked. And these questions were about the um, uh, power sequencing, uh, like the question said, only one nucleotide is added at every cycle. So most people just do one type of nucleotide, was one nucleotide. So, but that's kind of, again, not, not very nicely phrased. And uh, the other question, uh, what was it again? Uh, it was about whether the DDNTPs that are that have a color uh, give a color to the template. They don't give a color to the template, they give a color to the product of the sequencing, but I actually meant the product. So I gave points to everybody, no matter what the answer to that question. Another uh, thing that I'd like to talk about <coughs> regarding the quiz is uh, that yeah, there's one question that nobody got, that pretty much escaped everybody in yesterday's quiz, and that's the uh, one question about RPKM. So really no, nobody got that. Like RPKM is uh, like, you know, the number of reads divided by the, by the number of kilobases. Really nobody got that. And what's funny is that every, every year, I mean, like so far, I'm just doing the quiz just to make sure that I, uh, that I get a good score. And on that particular question, I, I also failed. So it's, it's the perfect question. Like everybody gets it wrong, but I still keep it because it's just a matter of looking at the definition. As soon as I answer that, I say, oh yeah, of course it's not the definition. Why did I think it was the definition? I don't know, but it seems to be kind of a bias, a cognitive bias that everybody answers wrong to that question. So I'm just giving you the heads up. Pretty much nobody got it. And the answer is that it's not the number of, of reads per KB, it's the number of reads per KB per million map reads. You must not forget that part of the definition. Okay, that's it for the uh, for the quiz stuff. Uh, one other thing is uh, I'd like to uh, maybe start with a poll, a little bit like last time, just to make sure. I think it's mostly the same people coming every week, so we're not going to, to learn much more, but I have another question for you on the poll. So let's get started with the uh, in-person attendance poll. So I think already you should see the questions on your side. And let's see what answers we get, whether you plan to attend when we're back in person or whether you don't want to. And also, I'd like, I'd like to know how people feel regarding, you know, their tolerance, let's say, with people not strictly respecting the rules. I think that's important that we're on the same page here to know whether we're mostly asking everyone to be strict or whether we're mostly not. I mean, whether we're mostly tolerant, basically. Okay, we've got 14 people answered, so that's that's good. That's everybody. Uh, up. And I share the results. So in principle, you guys can see the results uh, the same as me. So uh, 10 people say <coughs> that for sure this, they're going to come. Two people say no. And uh, two people say they haven't made up their mind. So compared to last week, I think there are, there are more people now who have decided that they're going to come. Last, last week, it was more don't know. Uh, but this number of people who are not going to come, I think, was about the same. Again, that's only 14 people who are polling here. The class is 40 students. So we don't really know what's going to happen 
uh, when other guys have decided to give us a sign of life. Um, about about the other question, so uh, ten people say for them it's it's actually important that everybody be strict, uh, not super sloppy with the rules, and for four people, it's like you know tolerance also goes a long way. So just for the class to know that we have currently a bias toward being a little bit strict. So if you're a person who's really on, on the other side uh, that tells you a little bit what the expectations are from the rest of the class, but also if you're on the strict side, you know, to know that one third is not a small number of people who say like we still have to live and work together and uh, we also have to tolerate a few, a few little things. We cannot be complete, you know, complete morons to each other. All right, so let's stop that and let's get started with the actual class. Is there any question regarding the return to in-person before we start the class proper? Are you excited? Me? I'm yeah. thrilled. Uh, of course, uh, I, there's the side of it I don't like, which is the epidemic side, obviously. Like, it's pretty clear that now it's been decided that we have to catch it no matter what because protections are kind of going away there's no there's no more like you know we can avoid it it seems that society has decided now you're gonna get your omicron whether you like it or not because that's the way it is so yeah gonna catch omicron that's the way it is and we hope there's going to be a small flu or very small symptoms but we don't know so that's the part i don't like that's the part i hate but on the other hand yeah uh when you look at the numbers like uh, people died of the flu a lot before and that's the part that we were not super you know concerned about and when you look at the numbers now they're close to the numbers of the flu and so if we're okay with the flu my opinion is that we have to be okay with other diseases that are in, on par with the flu um so that's the part that makes me a little scared a little worried but the part that I'm totally thrilled about is to be in person. Oh yeah, I love it. This is so much better um, for plenty of reasons. And so uh, at least that's the one part that I'd be happy to uh, to go back in person for. All right. Oh yes, yeah, sir. Oh, uh, sorry about that. So like, uh, not about going back in person, but I just had like one more question about the, the quiz grading. Cause I think uh, like, uh, I was hoping you explain how the bonus points for the quizzes work one more time. Is it just the last question that counts as a bonus or uh, yeah, I'm a little confused there. So like the, uh, th there's more than a hundred percent points in Biody 25 and the quizzes, like they have four bonus points. So just, just the parts that's on the quizzes, you know, if you, if you score all the quiz perfectly all the time and all the rest of Biody 25, you'd get 204%. But there are a couple of other bonus points. There's one bonus point for, for those of you who have chosen the articles already, they have had one bonus point. And so this is why I call them bonus points. In reality, it's, you know, it's not like the 13th question is bonus points. It's like overall, there is more points than 100. And so if you look at the coefficients, the quizzes should be 15% overall, but in reality, they're 19%. So that's, that's, that's the way the bonus points for the quiz work. But what I meant about the questions being badly phrased is that in your grades, like you will have one column per quiz, one column per assignment, etc., and there's one extra column which is called bonus points, and that's the way that I can, uh, you know, give general bonus points to the class whenever I mess up, for the sake of fairness. That's what I meant. Okay. okay. Thank you. Pleasure. All right. If no more questions. Then let's get started with today's class, which is on databases and algorithms. So the very first question of, of today, and this is pretty much also the last, is how do we compare two sequences? And that's going to bring us quite far. So let's say I've got these two sequences, this one here, starting of course with three prime here, a five prime and three prime there. And are these sequences similar? That's a very simple question. I've highlighted every difference here in red and every similarity in blue. So the first answer, people to answer that question did it in 1970, and they were Needleman and Wunsch, and they said, no, these two sequences are not similar. 
because the Levenstein distance between them is large. The Levenstein distance is the number of modifications necessary to transform a sequence into the other. Okay, so that's one way to say how do you compare sequences. You say I start from one sequence, the top one here starting with ATA, and how many changes do I need to make in order to translate it, to transform it into the second sequence. If I need to make zero change, obviously the sequences were identical. If I need to make tons of change, well, it's because they were not so close together, right? So that is the notion of the Levenstein distance. You just count the number of changes that you need to make to transform one into the other. And these changes can be changing a nucleotide or removing it or adding a nucleotide, okay? So that's a very general definition of a distance. So here the distance is 31, and these are 31 substitutions, and I've highlighted them in red, okay? To translate that, to transform that sequence into that sequence, you need to make 31 changes for a sequence that's 50 nucleotides, that's a lot, that's 60%, 62% of the nucleotides have to be changed. So Niedermann and Wunsch would say, no, no, these two sequences are really not close at all because you mostly need to change everything, like 62%. All right, that's the first answer that was given. But a little bit later came biology. So imagine that these parts that were in red, imagine that they're introns. And so it's kind of normal if you compare two sequences from different species, you expect that the introns will be dissimilar, uh, but that doesn't matter. Like these sequences are not even present in the, in the final RNA. So should we really care about literally every piece of the sequence or are there some pieces of the sequence that matter more than others? And also the fact that we have somewhere here pretty good match after all and imagine that on the left there is an intron on the right there is an intron then there's a pretty good match in the middle so you could say well in reality these sequences are similar it depends on the way you put it right so Smith and Waterman in 1981 gave another answer and they say yes these two sequences are similar because the similarity between them is large you don't focus on the differences you focus on the similarities the local score increases for a match and decreases for a difference that does not go below zero. The similarity is the highest score. Here the similarity is 18 because you have 19 matches and one mismatch. So how does that work? So we just add one when the two nucleotides match and remove one when the two nucleotides mismatch, but we never go below zero. So if we go back to the previous slide, here it means like it's zero, 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 zero. Okay, for 30 nucleotides, you're staying at zero because you never go below zero. But from GAT here, you say plus one, plus one, plus one. After this for the C, you say minus one. And then you continue plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. And let's see how high you can get with that. That's the definition of the similarity by Smith and Waterman. And in that particular example, you get to 18 similarities, which is pretty high. Just by chance, you'd not get to 18 in reality so just just these very simple questions are two sequences similar or the different you get different answers depending on the context and depending on how you want to look at it whether you want to focus on the differences or whether you want to focus on the similarities so these things uh, give rise to the concept of alignment and not an alignment is really something that's uh, like the basics of bioinformatics, pretty much everything has started with the concept of alignment. And you can have first the global alignment, which corresponds to the definition of Needleman and Wunsch, versus a local alignment, which corresponds to the definition of Smith and Waterman. So aligning two sequences means to exhibit their differences according to the Needleman and Wunsch criterion, or exhibit their similarities according to the Smith Waterman criterion, such that the symbols are aligned in a one-to-one -one correspondence. So you see this, aligning means just like putting on top of each other. And I'm using these vertical bars as the convention here to say that this is a match and I'm, one, I'm not using anything, it means it's not a match, it's a mismatch. And when you use the alignment with Niederman Wunsch, you see that mostly you're missing these vertical bars here. And with the Smith Waterman algorithm, you mostly have 
these vertical bars. You're focusing only on one part of the sequence because you're removing the parts that are not interesting. Needle non bunch is a global alignment, means you align everything, like the both sequences. And Smith Waterman says you align only the parts that have a good score. The one that, you know, when you have this plus one, minus one, if you reach a high peak, then this is what you align. That's called a local alignment. Why is that? Because whatever comes before, whatever comes after, doesn't influence the score at all. In comparison with the Niederland Wunsch, it does matter. So that's that's nice, that's easy. Just put the sequences on top of each other and see whether they correspond. And then if, it, if it's a local alignment, then remove everything that doesn't match and just focus on the biggest match. And if it's a global alignment, keep everything. So how hard can that be? Well, it is very hard, actually. And one thing is that there's a great evil in this story, and these are indels. So to give you an example of what indels are, try to align GATC with that particular sequence here. So we have a tiny one aligning with a, a large one. And one way to do it, um, which gives you a kind of a perfect score, is this one. Like you have GA that aligns well here, and TC that aligns well here. So that's pretty good, you know, 100% match. Or is it? Because in reality, you have all these symbols here that are indicated in red that haven't been aligned, that they, they do not contribute to the alignment. So it's not just a question of which nucleotides match each other. It's also a question of their spacing and how many symbols are there in one sequence or in the other. So we use the dash symbol, like this little dash here, to signify that a symbol has no counterpart in the other sequence. That is to say, two dash symbols never face each other in a pairwise alignment. This G here is facing a dash, it says, because that, that G in the long sequence doesn't correspond to any symbol in the short sequence. The dash symbol is called an indel, and that, that stands for insertion or deletion. Because to transform a sequence into the other, we need to add a symbol to one of the sequences or remove a symbol from the other. Okay, so indels make alignments slow. That's the point. If you didn't have indels, you just put the two sequences on top of each other and you could say match, 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 no match, 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 etc. That'd be fast. Yes, that's it. Yes, sir. So I'm just wondering, um, uh, for like if like, when we're comparing sequence, we're comparing a sequence of like uh, the same strand of let's say two genes, right? Like let's say the five prime three prime of one and then the five prime three prime again of another. Like is that how it works? Yeah, exactly. But you, you can also align uh, proteins, you can align English text, it's not a problem. You know, that definition is really uh, valid for pretty much every string you can think of. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So if you think about it in terms of English, for instance, the, uh, like the global alignment, the uh, Niederman Wunsch, they would tell you all these texts can be identical. Like this is used, for instance, for uh, detecting um, plagiarism. Okay, so this, this is exactly the kind of algorithm that I use for plagiarism detection. And if you've got uh, two texts that are completely identical, you'd say, well, obviously, you know, this completely plagiarized and their distance in the criterion of Niederman and Wunsch is really small. But think about the other case. You have two texts and then there is a good score with Smith Waterman. It means that you have a whole paragraph, but it's not completely identical to the whole paragraph. There are just like two sentences in the middle of the paragraph that are really a good match with each other. What would you conclude? You'd still say that's, that's still very suspicious, right? That's still, uh, there's no reason that this thing should occur by chance. And I will still conclude that this is a case of likely plagiarism. Even if the rest of the context don't align very well, the fact that these two sentences align very well to each other, then it would be considered to be a good match. So based on this, there is a bioinformatic dream, like really what everything or everybody in bioinformatics is trying to achieve. So you have a system here with a sequence, a database. And what you like is to be able to say, here's my database, here's my sequence give me other sequences that are similar to that sequence here. And so if you had a system, here's what you could do. 
with such a system one could answer many important questions. One, for instance, for example, is is this sequence important? Okay, like is it conserved? The definition of whether something is important in biology is whether it's conserved by evolution. Another question you may ask is what parts of the sequence are important in that sense? Like what are the sub sequences that I that I conserved? Because again, conservation is our criterion for importance. Another question that you could ask is, is this sequence duplicated? So many genes have got two copies, or we've, we've seen that some genes make copies of themselves, especially when they're transposons. And so you could say, do I find other examples of that sequence in my database, yes or no? Uh, another question you may ask is, who else used this sequence? You work on a particular sequence and people here in the world are uploading their in the database their work and you can see that um, my sequence here is is present and someone else is working on on my sequence so i may uh, send them an email ask them how they're doing etc and uh, see whether they work on the same thing as i do another question that you may ask is what is the sequence used for so the database maybe will tell you that sequences are used for one particular purpose, like CRISPR, for instance. Like this is a gene that is used for one particular biotechnological application. Another kind of question that you may ask is, where is the sequence in the genome? So you have one particular piece of sequence that you, uh, that you just acquired with a how to put sequencer, but you'd like to know what is this gene? What is this sequence? Where is it from? So there's one problem though is that one needs to compare the sequences with all the database using the Smith-Waterman algorithm. And even with the fastest computers, on the smallest databases, this is too slow. Okay, you, you see the problem, right? Is that to answer all these questions, it always boils down to exactly the same algorithmic problem. To know if my sequence is in the database, I need to compare it, or let's say a closed version of my sequence. I need to compare it to all the sequences in the database. And if there are a lot of sequences in the database, and if my method of comparison is slow, I'll never manage, okay? And this is also a question for plagiarism detection, actually, how do you do that? Like you have a lot of text that is written everywhere, Wikipedia plus everything else, how do you fast connect that these things are quite similar? They're not exactly identical, but they're quite similar to something else that has been written. So people were thinking about this a lot and they realized that at some point the problems are going to go too big and it will not be possible to use Smith Waterman anymore. So enter FASTA in 1985. FASTA was the first algorithm fast enough to compare a sequence to an entire database. It introduced the concept of seed and extend. And so it's a two-step process in order to align two sequences. And the first step is called seeding. And so the way it works is that you're looking for a perfect match. Why do you do that? It's because it's particularly fast. So you look for, for example, that particular sequence, CGA, etc. And if you can find an exact match in one of the proteins in the database, you say, okay, that's really a good start. So I know that this sequence here, which is pretty long already, is exactly present in another sequence that is there. So I'm going to keep this as a candidate. So that sequence here in the database is going to be my candidate. The key of FASTA is that seeding, that is to say searching perfect matches, can be done very fast. After that, the slow smith waterman algorithm needs to be run on very few candidates. Okay, so you know the sequence here at the bottom is one of your candidates, and then only on that sequence you run the smith waterman algorithm to find whether you have a hit. Okay, and that is still slow, of course, it, it never got faster. But the point is that you don't need to run that slow algorithm on every sequence of the database. That's the point. So you first discard 99% of the database to say, these guys don't have a perfect match here with my initial sequence. So I don't need to use the smith waterman And then when you have this 1% that remains or even less, then you run the slow version of the comparison algorithm. Yes, that's the Yes, sir. So if I'm uh, getting this uh, accurately, then uh, uh, I'm assuming that with the, the seeding is to see like where 
like which which sequence would actually match with the the one that I have and extend would be to see like if there's any difference within that sequence I just selected or uh, how does it work like did it get that right? Yeah, so during the CD you take every subsequence of your of your query. So here I'm showing something that's length approximately 10 to 11 and that's realistic and you're looking for a perfect match. So there has to be an absolutely exact match. And once you've got that exact match, you say this is a seed where I'm going to grow an alignment. So you just put that in as the beginning of the Smith Waterman alignment. So you tell the Smith Waterman alignment, go left, go right, because you already have a good score. You know, like if you have 10 nucleotides that are a match, it's already plus 10. So see how, how far you can go on the right and how much the score will rise. Do the same on the left. And so that'll give you a big window with a good score. So that's the uh, okay that makes sense so like, like that part in the blue is like what i'm trying to get a perfect match for right yeah and you try this okay. with literally every substring of the original sequence okay and that is okay fast. thank you so much it's actually much faster than running the smith waterman algorithm on every sequence right. so that's good like 1985 was already the beginning of a of a small revolution in bioinformatics there was one problem though faster is a heuristic, it means an approximation. It means that it misses hits. Okay, you, you can have two sequences that are relatively similar, relatively close, but they never have 10 nucleotides in a row that are identical. Okay, like it's always nine or something like this. But imagine you got nine, 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 nine all over the sequence, then that'd be a pretty good score, but you've never discovered it because you require 10 in a row and that never happens between these two proteins. So even worse, FASTA could not tell whether a hit was significant. That is to say whether the score was above what you expect by chance when comparing a sequence to any large database. And that's a bit of a problem. So you, you have a request, a query, and then you query the database, you get a hit. You say, oh my God, there's a good, there's a good score. And then a colleague asks you, how good is it? You say, I don't know, which is good. And FASTA was not able to tell you well, that's actually significantly above random because that's what we care about. We want to find things that are not random. So FASTA was not able to do this, and that was one of the main problems. If you have a big database, just by chance, you will get big score. That's just because you will increase the number of comparisons between your query and the number of sequences in the database. So this was solved in 1990 by BLAST and the BLAST. And BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. It was faster than FASTA and it could evaluate whether hits were likely due to chance alone. So the novelty was the statistical model to evaluate the chance that the heuristic fails using Turing theory and random walks. So there was a bit of mathematical theory that was done in the background and that was a very interesting thing to do because it really allowed to gain a lot of speed compared to FASTA. So the method works the same. So you first use a seed to find a hit. So that's the first step here, the seed. And then you have the extend and it works exactly the same. So there's no change so far in the uh, seed and extend compared to FASTA. So BLAST is almost the same as FASTA. The difference is that there is a new step, the third step here, which is to evaluate the significance the significance based on the theoretical work. So it was able, Blast was able to say, you got a hit here, but that it's completely random. Like the score is exactly the same as what you expect by chance. Or to say the opposite, say you got a hit here and that hit is not random. There is something, some conservation going on here. This is a real conservation. So that's really the advantage of Blast over FASTA. And just because he was able to do this, he was able to go faster. Why? Because he was able to discard hits earlier than FASTA. Okay? When you're able to do this, the point is that you're allowed to bail out, to not do the smith waterman when you realize earlier that, okay, this particular seeding uh, hit that we've got, it's random. Like, it's not worth spending more time running the slow algorithm. So that's how he gained time. It was by being smart about the sequence that he will spend time aligning, which is the one that will not even spend time aligning because it's already clear from that first stage that this was random. So it seemed like BLAST solved everything. So if you look at the papers from the 90s, 
this blast, 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 blast. Everybody was just using blast and that was awesome. And we were thinking, man, what, what can possibly go wrong? Now we kind of sold by informatics. That's awesome. So what went wrong is half put sequencing, of course, because whenever you do half put sequencing, you have questions like these ones. Resequencing, for instance, like you have a genome that you have already sequenced, like the human genome, and you're sequencing it again, you would need to know what the reads refer to in order to update the genome. Okay, you want to improve the, the version of the genome, you got to read, you got to know what, what sequence in your genome are you going to update? What does that change, that read here? How do you answer that? When you genotype someone, okay, to know what are your SNPs, you sequence stuff, you need to know now which SNPs the reads contain in order to know the alleles. If you want to know all the SNPs of an individual, you'll have to say, okay, I got that read here, but which is the SNP among the 3 million SNPs in the human genome that it contains, that if it contains any one of these SNPs at all. If you're doing RNA-seq, you need to know which gene the reads correspond to in order to know their expression. Okay, I got a read, which is one of the 20,000 genes that corresponds to that read. How do I know that? Etc. So after sequencing, we almost always need to know where the reads map in the genome. What these problems have in common is that at the end of the day, what you care about is to know that particular sequence that I got out of the sequencer, where does it go in the genome? What are the sequences in the genome that correspond to that sequence? N not nearly exactly, but that correspond approximately to make sure that these are almost the same sequences. So here's a little problem for you. Stop and think what problem or problems does not require the reads to be mapped to a sequence genome. So these are examples of problems where in order to answer, you need to know where the gene, where the reads go to a genome, but there are some other problems where you don't need to know that. Think about what they could be. So this really gave rise to what is called the mapping problem. And that's something that's completely standard since half put sequencing. So mapping means aligning a read to a genome in order to find its location. You say, I sequence something, where is that sequence from? Which, which part of the genome does it come from? That's mapping. The process is difficult because of sequencing errors, DNA variations, assembly errors, and contaminations. So imagine that if the sequences were exactly identical to some other sequence in the genome, that'd be kind of easy because you just like find a perfect match, it's done. But it's never exactly like that. Th think about DNA variations, for instance. We have the human reference genome, but that's nobody's genome. That's not your genome, that's not my genome. This is actually a consensus genome. They have removed some things uh, that are different between us and they've put some arbitrary SNPs in there but this is no one in particular, no one has that genome, which means that if I sequence, for example, a piece of my DNA, and then I want to, to know where the sequence is from, it's not going to be exactly the same as in the reference human genome, because my genome is not the reference human genome. There are also the sequencing errors, which means that whenever we read a particular piece of DNA, it's not exactly the same. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. Like it looks like it's a T, but actually it was an A or a G. And so you will have the problem of aligning that, of finding a near perfect match, but not necessarily perfect. And you also have other things like the fact that the genome is not correct, it's not been assembled correctly, so some things don't really map where they should. And you also have contaminations, things that come from other genomes, or imagine that I just hugged a monkey just before, and then what we think is my hair is actually the hair of a monkey. And so it's going to not map exactly at the same location it's going to some to cause some errors so with millions of reads the search time of fasta is too slow fasta or blast for 100 million reads mapped in 0.1 second this is four months of waiting time so here i meant i meant blast here but you use blasts in order to tell okay i got that sequence here tell me where it matches in the genome it's fast it takes 0.1 second uh, this, you know, you don't, you don't wait a lot to get the answer when you do that. It's pretty nice. The problem is that you have 100 million reads. And so now that means that to get all of them, you have to wait four months. And that's not acceptable anymore. That's more time than it took you to sequence it. So with half-input sequencing, all known algorithms became obsolete. 
they became too slow. So that was a bit of a problem when the, when these technologies came around 2000, let's say seven or something like that, because it was clear like, okay, what are we gonna do? We don't have an algorithm that will allow us to, to do that operation very fast. So here's something for you to think about. Why looking for similar sequences is pretty much the same as knowing where the gene maps in the genome. You have to have that correspondence well anchored in your mind so that you can really make progress on this lecture. So there's a memory speed trade-off, which is something that's completely classical in, in algorithms. So one, one way you can solve that problem is to make bigger database and to pre-compute a lot of what you need. So imagine that you do that, that you, you make an enormous database where you have pre-computed all sorts of alignments already so that you don't have to recompute them every time. But you need to store them, that's the problem. So it go like that, like you have a read, then you, you query it in a very, very large database where you have pre-computed all possible sorts of alignments already, and then you could get very fast your answer because you've done the work before and you stored all the answers. But if you don't have that much memory, if you have a much smaller uh, memory to work with, then every time you make the request, you have to recompute everything from scratch because you were not able to store all the intermediate of computation or to pre-compute or to guess anything. So if your memory is, is slow, then you have a slow algorithm because you need to recompute everything every time. So the more memory you have, the faster your algorithm can be, and this, and the less memory you have, and the kind of slower it's gonna be because you need to compute more every time. You can't pre-compute anything. That's called the memory speed trade-off. So the more you store, the less you need to compute. It is possible to index the database to gain speed at the time of mapping the reads, right? Like you, you waste time in the beginning when you construct the database, but after this, everything runs fast. But to make the seeding step of BLAST faster, you need more RAM than even powerful computers have. So people thought, okay, we can, we can get by with BLAST, it's fine, but the computers, they don't have enough memory. It's not gonna work. It's very sad. And then came the FM index. So the FM index appeared in 2000, and it stands for Fast Minute Index. And also it's a pun because the inventors of Ferragina and Mancini. And it is based on something that's called the Burroughs Reader Transform, a technology that's used for data compression. So usually you use zip or sometimes RAR, but there's another thing that's called bzip2 that's based on that particular compression and gives better compression. The FM index is very compact, so one can have the benefits of a large index even with a small RAM. So that's the whole point here. The significance of the FM index was not realized immediately. It took several years before it was applied to bioinformatics. So with, with the FM index, you can have your cake and eat it. It means that you don't need to store that many enormous pre-computations in the database because it's very compact. So even if you have a small RAM, you will be able to pre-compute a lot of things in that small RAM. That's what it means by fast minute. It's just a way to reduce the number, like the amount of RAM you need in order to pre-compute stuff. So with the FM index, it's now possible to have a database in which you can query something, get the result fast, because you have pre-computed the stuff and you didn't take a lot of space to store it. So with the FM index, it became possible to index the human genome with four gigabytes of RAM. That's what you need. This was high-end in 2007. There were few computers that had it when the first high-throughput sequencing technology arose. Nowadays, even laptops have that much RAM and they can use the FM index. So back then it was like, wow, you got a four gig computer, man, and you're so rich. And now it's like, yeah, everybody has them. So that kind of solved the problem, basically. The fact that from 2000, this technology appeared around 2007, 2008, people realized that they can use that for bioinformatics and then were able to cram it to computers that were still kind of not everybody had them but by 2010 or 12 already everybody had computers that were that fast i mean not that fast that big so came these two uh these two algorithms these two tools called bwa and bowtie 
and they both appeared in 2009 for the first time. They were the first mappers or aligners able to process millions of reads in a few hours. BWA stands for Burroughs Reader Aligner, and Bowtie is a pun on the acronym BWT, that's the Burroughs Reader Transform. So they both use the FM index for seeding, and then the smith waterman algorithm to find the best hit for the read in the genome. So they are based on seed and extend. So it's still exactly the same idea as FASTA, as this one of the very first algorithms that came, except that the algorithm runs differently. The time to map a read is approximately 100 microseconds, which is 100 to 1,000 times faster than BLAST on the same hardware. So that's really a very significant speed up. With BLAST, you would have to wait a couple of months. With BWM Bowtie, they give you the same results, maybe even better, and you have to wait only a couple of hours. So the process goes like this. You have a read, you query it in the database with either BWM Bowtie. So what is this database? It's an index of the genome. Like you have downloaded the genome, index it. It just takes four gigabytes of your RAM, and that's your local database. And then you get the answer of what the, where that read goes in the genome, and you get this fast. You get this in 100 microseconds, really fast. So nowadays, BWA and Bowtie have been updated. Most people use BWA MEM, where MEM stands for Maximal Exact Match. So that's kind of an updated version of BWA. Or they use Bowtie 2. There are other mappers, but BWA MEM and Bowtie 2 are the most popular. OK, so that's something that is for free. This, this is free software, and we're going to use them uh, next week, one of them at least. And you'll see how that works in, in detail. But the process is that it will really process millions of reads in just a couple of hours compared to everything else that came before. So that's good enough. That's really nice. But the problem is that computation is electricity. And faster algorithms are always cheaper and more environmental friendly. So as far as algorithms go, good enough is just never good enough. If you can do better, you should do better. And if, if one reason you have to think about is just electricity. Like if you can do these things 10 times faster or 100 times faster, it also means saving 10 times or 100 times more electricity, which nowadays also means saving a lot of CO2 when you think about it. So this is why even if just with PWA and Bowtie, we are already able to solve almost all the problems that we have, if we can do better, then we should do better. So can we do better with RNA-seq, for instance? So the, the process of RNA-seq with BWR Botai goes like this. You have a read, you map it in the genome. So that's the part that is taken care of by BWR Botai that gives you the location. Once you got the location, you got the gene. Well, now you know that this gene has at least a bit of expression. And from that, you can compute the RPKM, everybody's favorite friend. So you have that particular process here. but the issue is that the location is irrelevant. All we need is the gene. Okay, If we could just directly know that this read here maps to that gene, we don't know to know where it goes in the genome and where is the location of that gene. So all we need is the gene or the transcript to which the read maps. Is there a way to know the gene without necessarily having to compute the location? If we could do that, we could save a lot of computations just to know the place of the genome and the location. If we could teleport from read to gene or read to transcript, because that's all we care about. And there's sailfish. So we're talking things that are pretty recent now in terms of technologies. Sailfish in 2014 introduced the concept of alignment-free quantification. So far, everything we've seen is to make this alignment, like to make them faster. But from 2014, people start to say, we don't even need to align. You know, that's not, not even particularly useful. The name sailfish is a reference to the underlying algorithm called jellyfish. So sailfish is just a wrapper around jellyfish, itself a reference to not sure what. So actually, I, I wrote an email to the, to the creator of sailfish. And they explained to me that uh, the first author is French, and because everything is based on Kmer, thought mer, C has to be with fish. What about jellyfish? Good enough for reason. Sailfish is based on Kmer index that is unrelated to the FM index. It is approximately 20 times faster than BWA or Bowtie, but it works only for RNA-seq. It doesn't work for mapping reads to the genome. So what is a Kmer? 
this is a subsequence, a substring. Imagine that you have a read here that starts with ATC, GAT, etc. So the k-mer, when k equals 10, would be every substring of size 10 that you extract from the read. Okay, so here you have that particular sequence, the 10 mers, the k-mers with k equals 10 would be a, T, C, G, etc. That's the sequence that's here. That's the first k-mer. The second k-mer is T, C, G, A, T, C, etc. That's the one. The third k-mer is C, G, A, T, C. You can see it's here. C, G, A, T, C. You get the point. And I'm just shifting my window one nucleotide and I keep 10 nucleotides all the time. That's a k-mer. And now think about it. If I've got uh, gene A, B, C, D, etc. and I've stored their k-mers in in an index. I can see that gene A has got that camer, it has that got that camer, it has got that camer. Gene B has got only this one and nothing else. And gene C has got none of them. What do you think is the gene that this read comes from? It's kind of intuitive that it's gene A, right? Because it's got pretty much the same sequence in reality. So it doesn't matter where gene A is, it doesn't matter how to align that particular read with the sequence of gene A, we just count camers. We say I could extract 37 k-mers from the read. Out of these ones, 36 are in gene A, and every, everything else has got almost nothing. Why well, it's got to be gene A? Yes, that's it. Yes, yeah, sir, sorry about that. Do you mind explaining uh, k-mer one more time? I'm getting a little lost. The k-mer? So yeah, what, yeah. what is a k-mer, or how, how do you use them? Uh, yeah, uh, 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 both, like, uh, like what is it and like how do you like how is it really used to uh like uh quantify things yeah so let's start with uh what is a camera and we're going to uh to give an example with english because it's maybe going to be easier think that we were we want to extract the streamer from the word introduced okay so the first streamer is i n t the second is n t or the third is t or o or od etc so these are the cameras okay you just like scan your word and you extract all the consecutive letters and k equals three in that case with the int etc but for dna it's it's a bit longer like the example i'm giving here is uh, with 10 words k equals 10 okay and the question that we have is we have a read we want to know which transcripts or which gene that reads corresponds to. So either we can go through the long process of mapping that read in the genome to say, oh, it's at chromosome 17 position such and such. What is the gene there? Oh, that's the gene uh, that's called uh, not one. Oh, well, that's probably a transcript for not one then. So that would be one way, but we, we don't want to do that. We want to say, if that read has a sequence that's similarly, you know, like that's approximately good enough corresponding to the sequence of that transcript, then we can say directly, let's not waste time. That read comes from that transcript. It doesn't matter where that transcript is in the genome. So how do we do this? We want to have a measure of the correspondence between the sequences. And if they have the same k-mers or similar k-mers, it means the sequences are pretty much the same, right? So. You, you could do the same with uh, 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 two English words, for example, that are almost exactly the same. So it's difficult to find examples of existing English words that are different, uh, but relatively similar. Um, um, I mean, introduce and introducing, for example, and you could see that the, the trimers that you would e extract from introduce and introducing would kind of be very similar. They'd start to be different only at the end when you have use or using. So you'd say, well, you know, out of these so many trimers that I could extract, they're very similar. So introduce must be a word that's relatively close to introducing. And that's good enough for me to say that the words are similar. So here's the same idea. I have a read that I sequence. I have pre-computed all the cameras of the genes here, all the transcripts. And I'm saying that particular read is relatively close to that gene, so it must come from that gene. That's good enough a criterion for me. So I'm just counting the k-mers that are in common between the read and every gene here. So that's the, that's the strategy. It's another version of k 
computing the similarity between sequences. It's not based on the Levenstein distance or the Smith Waterman score. It's just based on how many cameras do they have in common. So okay, this makes a lot more sense. Right. All you need is to know which gene or transcript has more cameras in common with the read. Comparing cameras can be done extremely fast. Lookups in the camera index is even faster than lookups in the FM index. And you never need to compute the, lo the actual location of the read in the genome or in the gene. All you do is c count the cameras that are the same. If you have a lot, you say, okay, this read is from that gene. Otherwise you say, no, it's not from that gene. I think that's the last slide before, before the break. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's finish that now and then we'll have the break. So after Sailfish came Callisto and Salmon. Callisto is from 2016, Salmon is from 2017, and they gain even more speed by reducing the number of cameras to compare with the transcriptome. The main idea is that you just need to compare cameras that discriminate the transcripts. The other ones do not allow you to know which transcripts the read come from. So here this is a little picture that shows that if you have, uh, for example, alternative transcripts, they have the same sequence in the beginning, but at some point, you know, the sequence kind of diverge, at least in an ideal space. Like one transcript will continue with a certain path of possible sequence, another transcript will have another path. And if the end of the sequence is the same, you could imagine that you, you, you make a drawing like this, where they again rejoin because the sequence at the end is the same. And the idea of both algorithms, and I don't want to go in, into details, is that they don't store every camera. They store only the cameras that will allow you to distinguish these isoforms. So if you have that camera here, for example, then the algorithm is smart enough to say, if you have this one, you will have all the other ones anyway, because the sequences are similar. And they w whether you have them or not, you won't be able to tell whether this is sequence one, two, or three. So that's how you gain speed, by just removing some of these cameras. Both are based on a modified camera index, and they're both approximately 10 times faster than Sailfish, which was itself much faster than BWA and Bowtie. So there's a lot of speed that is gained here. So next class, we will use BWMM to illustrate how to map reads to a genome in DNA seg. And right now, I want you to remember that Bowtie is an alternative. It's equally popular and gives slightly different results, it's not exactly the same. We also use Salmon to illustrate how to quantify gene expression in RNA-seq. And I want you to remember that Callisto is an alternative that's very popular and that gives slightly different results, same efficiency but different results. So time for the break. Uh, it's 3.06. Uh, let's get back together at 3.10, 3.11. See you there. Okay, welcome back for the second half of of Biology 25 about algorithms and databases. So one important thing before we we actually use all these things in practice on the cluster is to understand that there are file standards. Is that all these algorithms they exchange information with each other using standards. And so there are three particular standards that I want everybody to know because they're kind of near universal in bioinformatics. There's the FASTA format that is named after the now obsolete FASTA software. And it is used for chromosomes, scaffolds, and transcript. When you just want to give a DNA sequence to a friend, you put it in FASTA format. There's the FASTQ format that is named after the FASTA format where they replaced A with a Q. We'll see why in a second. And it is used for high throughput sequencing reads. So the high throughput sequencer, which is that machine here, what you get when the run is over is a fast Q file that gives you the reads. And we're going to see in a second what they look like. And the last format that I want you to know about is the SAM format that is used for alignments. So the typical pipeline runs like this. You sequence something, like some real thing, like you know, a hair or whatever that is in that machine here, and you get a file. This file is in FASTQ format. These are the reads. You also get the sequence of the genome that you download from the internet. We'll do that 
So you got the, the FASTA version of the genome. Okay, doesn't mean that FASTA was used in any way for that. It's just is this is the file format that was already designed in 1985 because FASTA was the first first software in bioinformatics, if you want. So we still use that format here. So we have the version of the genome in FASTA format that allows us to index the genome. We make this little database with the FM index that's really tiny and cute. And then we use BW or Bowtie to map the reads in that genome. And that gives us a SAM file that tells that read, you know what? It goes there in the genome, chromosome one, position 10, etc. Uh, if this thing here were RNA-seq, well, your FASTA file now is a transcriptome. Again, you download it from the internet and then you use Salmon or Callisto and they give you directly the TPM. And there's no particular file format for that. It's just a text file and it says that gene, TPM is that. That's it. Nothing, nothing more than that. So the three files you need to understand and to know are FASTA, FASTQ and SAM. So we start with the FASTA format, which is by far the easiest. So every sequence in the file starts with a header here that has this greater than sign. And then you put whatever you want, sequence one, chromosome one, whatever I like. So that's the reference or the name of the sequence, chromosome, transcript, whatever that is. If it's a genome, so you'd have, for example, chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three. And and the DNA that comes after that would be really, really long because it's a whole chromosome. And at the end, you'd get something like mitochondrial genome or stuff like that, you know, that still are part of the genome and um, that would have a much shorter sequence. So you start with the header and then here you go, DNA, like A, C, T, blah, blah, blah. So you just can put the DNA like this. The, the size of the lines does not matter. Like it, it doesn't really mean that there's a break here or anything like this. And if you want to make it 60 nucleotides or 80 or everything on one line, no one cares. This is just up to you. So that's the FASTA format. Super easy. The FASTQ format now is a little bit more difficult. So the thing to understand is that the FASTQ format is only for sequencing reads. Really, everything you have in a FASTQ file are sequencing reads which means stuff that comes from a high throughput sequencer. And the first thing to understand is that the read is split over four lines. So every four lines is one read, then other four lines is another read. And these four lines always have the same structure. So the first here is the header, it's the name of the read. Every read in the sequencer has a name. And so you start with an at, and then you got something like s or, or whatever that is. So here that's a reference for that particular read. And then you've got things that is really hard to understand. So what is it? Often it contains the name and the serial number of the sequencer on which it was sequenced. So Sally 261, that is probably the machine on which that read was sequenced. That thing here is some sort of code name that could be anything at all. And these like 2, uh, 1101, 1442, 1998, those are the coordinates of the spot on the glass slide. If you remember these promotional videos that we watched, like there is this glass slide on which Lumina is sequencing everything. And so there are these colored spots that are used to decode the sequence. And these spots have actual coordinates and these are the coordinates. So like uh, the second tile, and then you go like uh, 1101 micrometers, on the left, 1442 micrometers on the right, cycle, whatever, etc. And so this one here means is the forward read. You get a two for the reverse read of the same DNA. Okay, so that's a pretty long name with a lot of information and most of the time we really don't care, but we have it just in case. Then comes the sequence, the actual sequence that was decoded by the machine. So N, the first time, didn't get anything concrete here, doesn't know what it was. And after this, it got that sequence, ATDT, etc. That's the actual sequence that the instrument measured. Then comes a plus, always a plus, don't ask why. And then comes the quality. That's called the quality, and that's what gives the Q in fast Q. 
in the fast app with quality. So quality is, is a little bit of a, of a topic that's not straightforward here. Uh, the first thing that you have to observe is that there's one symbol of quality for every symbol of the sequence. Okay, so it's always a one-to-one -one correspondence. Like you have the nucleotides on line two, on line four, there's as many symbols as the nucleotides because every symbol here for the quality estimates the probability that the nucleotide was decoded correctly by the machine. Remember that there's a microscope in the Illumina machine that measures the lights on four different channels, uh, usually uh, red, green, uh, blue, yellow. And based on how much light it received in each of these channels, it will make a call saying, I think it's a C, I think it's a T, etc. It also has internally a way to know the confidence for every nucleotide. And this confidence is represented here in that sequence that is there. That's the quality. So it's also called the FRED quality. FRED was the first software that used this convention. Uh, but like, you know, just say quality or FRED quality means the same. So each nucleotide is given a quality expressing the confidence of the sequencer that this is really the right nucleotide. And this is based on the ASCII code. So the, what are the ASCII characters? These are the ASCII, like the symbols on your keyboard. If you're using the US keyboard, then everything that you see on your keyboard is ASCII. If you're using a non-US keyboard, like French keyboard or any keyboard from any other country, then these are not the ASCII symbols. So ASCII just means the Latin alphabet with the American symbols like dollar, etc., and then these like you know apostrophe here. So these are the usual things that you see on an American keyboard. And the ASCII code just says that every one of them has a number, so they're ordered. Like it's not really the alphabetical order; it's the ASCII order. Okay, like for computer nerds, and so you have symbols that are not printable, like space, tab. Uh, delete etc so they really have a, a code but because they're non-printable on screen then we put them first and so we start at the sharp side like the you know this like hash symbol here okay so then the order is hash dollar percent and etc it goes really in a deterministic way and you'd say the symbols that are on the left end they mean that we're really not confident about the nucleotide that was decoded and the symbols that are on the right end here in green, we're pretty confident about them. We think that uh, these nucleotides, when they have that quality, we're pretty sure that they're good. Okay, so like the low symbols mean low confidence, the high symbol mean high confidence. And the convention is that every 10 symbols, okay, you increase your confidence with this rule here. The plus sign, means that you're 90% sure, okay? Everything that has a plus, like there's no example with a plus, but if you had a plus here, let's say this one here, it'd not be a one, it'd be a plus. It means that the machine is 90% chance that it would be an A, okay? If you go 10 symbols on the right, so like the five, then you're 99% sure. If you go 10 symbols again on the right, like the question mark, then you're 99.9% .9 sure. And if you go 10 symbols on the right, like an I, 99.99% sure. You see the logic, right? So every time you go 10 symbols on, on the right, you diminish your uncertainty by a factor 10. Okay, like the error here is only one in 10,000. Okay, this is one in a thousand. Okay, this is one in a hundred. Okay, this is one in 10. So that's kind of a bit of a, of a, weird, uh, a weird way to measure quality. But all you have to remember is that the symbols that look like this, like uh, hash, dollar, percent, it means bad, bad, bad. The nucleotide is probably wrong. And everything that looks like capital letters, like already A, B, C, D, F, G, that's pretty good because you're close to 99.9% .9 sure that the nucleotides are the ones that are showed here. Okay, so a bit of a complicated code, but when you think about it, it's just a way to represent numbers with letters. That's all it is. Like this stands for 90%, this stands for 99%, this stands for 99.9% .9 and so on. So that was the FASTQ format. Remember that's the one that is for reads as they go out of the sequencer. Now there's the SAM format, 
which is the output of PWA or bow tie. So it's the ones that tell you where the reads go in the genome. So let's start with the header, and the header can have many lines. It's not one header per line. Like this depends on the number of pieces, let's say chromosomes or, or contigs or scaffolds that you had in your genome. So you have one row, one line in the header per chromosome. So I'm taking these two examples here. And so it starts with at SQ. That means that this is header stuff. Sequence name 2L. That's something from Drosophila. There's a chromosome that's called 2L. Ln is the length. Here's the length of chromosome 2L in that reference. Okay, SQ is just to say that this is the header line. So you start with a couple of lines that describe your genome. Then you have the reads. And the reads can be in one row or on two rows. If the reads are paired, because you have a forward read and a reverse read, then they come on two rows all the time. Okay? If you have only the forward read, then you have only one row per, per read. And so here you can see that they have that name here. They both have the same name because they are coming from the same molecule. This is the forward read and the reverse read. And then come a couple of uh, fields th that are that have different levels of complexity. So the very first field is the read name. Then comes the flag with codes like 83, 163, etc. So this is a code name, and we're going to see a bit like later in the next slide, I think, what this stands for. Then you got the actual information that we care about, the scaffold or chromosome where the map was, where the read was mapped, and the exact position in the genome or in that scaffold here where this is mapped. So it says it's on that particular chromosome to L at position 4 million. Okay, so you go 4 million, eight, like 889,373 nucleotides after the first, and bang, this is exactly where you're going to find the sequence of the read that was in the FASTQ file. Okay, so chromosome position, that's really what we came here for, what we use the algorithm for. Then comes mapping quality. Here it says 60. So that's something that we're going to describe next, and that's not the same thing as FRED quality. Uh, then you have the what is called the cigar, which is telling you how many nucleotides were aligned. It's 101M means that it aligned 101 nucleotides. M stands for matched or mismatched. Like the, the read was 101 nucleotides and it, it, it was all completely aligned to the genome. You didn't have to chop it and say, I ignored 63 nucleotides or whatever that is from your read. And then the fields that are highlighted in green or information about the other read of the same pair. You can see that here equals means it's on the same scaffold. And this coordinate, oops, sorry. This coordinate here is exactly this one. And this one is exactly this one. So it's just a cross reference saying, by the way, the other guy was at that location on that chromosome or another other chromosome at that location. And here it just says the other guy was like 380 nucleotides before me. And this one says the other guy is 280 nucleotides after me. So these two numbers match, of course, because they're just cross-referencing each other. That's what they're doing here. Then you have the sequence of the read in blue and the thread quality. So these things are taken from the FASTQ file. And they're just put after so that you don't have to look them up in the FASTQ file. Like in one row, you have really everything you need to know. What read was this? A couple of information that we're going to describe in a second. Where did it go in the genome? To L, that location. How confident am I that it goes there? 60. Uh, how many nucleotides were aligned? 101. Where does the other read go? There. What was the sequence again? This. And the quality again? This. And then you got a couple more fields, but that's a lot of information there. So the flags, they're a bit confusing. How do, how do they work? So it's just a clever way to signify, to answer several yes, no questions at the same time. So you put all your questions here in boxes and tick the box if the answer is yes, and you give them numbers. Like the first question is associated with number one, second with number two, four, eight, 16, and so on. It goes until uh, 1024, I think, in the case of some. So the first question is, does the read have a pair? Like, is this read paired end or is it just one forward read? Question number five is, does the read map on the, on the 
forward spread or did you have to reverse complement the read in order to map it like this, like going from right to left on the chromosome? So here you say yes, the read, the read has a pair, and yes, I needed to reverse the chromosome, the, the read. So that means 1 plus 16, that gives you 17. And that's a unique code to which questions did you answer yes to. Okay, that's just a you know, computer nerd type of approach. So this is used mostly to know if the read is mapped in forward, like this, or like that, or reverse orientation. Other flags are redundant with the rest of the record. We don't need to focus on 248, etc. Even on one, it's not very important. So example, if you get the number 83, 83 is 1 plus 2 plus 16 plus 64. That's the only way to decompose 83 with powers of 2 like that. So which means that you have answered yes to the question, uh, this one, this one, the 16 and the 64. And so it doesn't matter what 1, 2 and 64 are, you have answered yes to the question that gives 16. So you know that the read is like that. Okay, like you have answered yes and I, I reversed the read. So for 83, you need to have answered yes here. The read is mapping on the reverse orientation, not on the forward orientation. So that's how you use the flags. And the one that matters the most is this one, the flag 16 here, because it tells you the orientation of the read like this or like that. Other ones are less important. Now this mapping quality. You have a read and imagine that sometimes there'll be some hesitation, some hesitancy. Does it go here on the genome or does it go there? So does the read really map to the proposed scaffold and location? Reads with mapping quality below 20 are often discarded. So there is this quantification that says that, well, most of the time there's only one possibility of putting the read in the genome, but sometimes we're not really sure because there's another sequence of the genome that looks a little bit like the read. And okay, it's more likely it goes there, but there's still a chance that actually the sequence that was that was a kind of produced was coming from another place. So that's what you quantify with mapping quality. So how does it work? Is that the quality goes like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. 60 is the max. Nobody gives quality higher than 60 these days. And it's a little bit similar to the FRED quality in the sense that when the quality is 10, you're 90% sure that the read is at the good location. When the quality is 20, you're 99% sure. When the quality is 30, you're 99.9% .9 sure, and so on. You add a nine every time you add 10 to the quality. So if we go back to, the, to this slide here, you can see that both of them got quality 60, which means that BWA thinks that there's only one chance in a million that it made a mistake by putting them there. So pretty confident, pretty overconfident dude, BWA. Okay, so that's the way quality works. It's not the same as FRED quality, because here they give you numbers, they don't give you letters, but it's the same idea. Every time you increase by 10, okay, then you add a 9 to your confidence, or a 0.9. So if you stop and think, why would a read map to the wrong location? What could be the reasons that PWM made a mistake? So now here, we're going to, to go through a, a couple of tools that are really useful. How to answer the question, where is this stuff? For this, you use the UCSC genome browser. That's the one that I showcased in the very first lecture. So UCSC was the first to, uh, organization to create a genome browser. It allowed users to visualize the human genome. Today, it comes with a few genomes by default and contains more than just genes. We use the genome browser to locate genes and know what is around. So that's what I showed to you in the very first class, that you can have, have click buttons, you can zoom in, zoom out. If you just put the gene of your dream in the search box, then it will just show it to you, and then you can scroll left and right to see what happens. How to answer the question, what is that stuff? You use blasts, like the NCBI blasts. Uh, if you just you know google blast in general you come to that website here so blast can be used to identify an unknown sequence like this one this is a protein sequence you can see that mppp etc this is not dna so you just go to the enter accession number gi's or fasta sequence doesn't matter you just copy paste your stuff in there it's going to deal with it 
and then you press search which is at the bottom it's not shown on the screen here and then it will just do the work for you and tell you oh you know that sequence here i've got a hit in the database it's this protein from this organism that was sequenced at that time so when you don't know what you've got then you can just blast it and then it tells you it's that dude how to answer the question what else looks like this stuff you don't want to know you know what your stuff is this is rubisco from i don't know your favorite plant arabidopsis but you'd like to know what other rubisco are in the database that look like that use blast again remember blast is really good at finding similar sequences that's what it was made for blast was actually designed to identify homologs in other genomes it is still one of its main uses today almost everybody uses that whenever you have a question what does my protein look like in another organism how do i do that well you put your protein here like that particular sequence but you have the organism here field and you could say i want to look for it for example is there a rubisco in horses or something like that so you can just say just look for things in that particular species and tell me which similar sequences you find here or you want to know whether there is another copy of rubisco in the same plant and so you can say again in arabidopsis gives me the th the sequences that look like that so of course you're going to get the first rubisco because it comes from that plant but your second hit if there is one will tell you there's another similar hit that looks like this that's coming from the same plant So there are also a couple of databases that are pretty interesting to work with that are public as a benthometrician or a student. So the first one that I'd like to mention is GEO, that stands for Gene Expression Omnibus, and it stores raw sequencing data for academic publications. And there's a lot of it. Like storing uh, sequencing data is really a burden, but they still do it. It is often mandatory to release the data nowadays in order to publish something on the, um, on the scientific journals. They would ask that if you have some sequencing data they want to show proof that you have put it on geo they want to see the number just for the record maintainers make sure that the metadata of the record is accurate so they also make sure like you say what organism that was what was done to this organism how it was sequenced all these things that's the metadata so it's a pretty amazing database for people who want to have something to do with genomics because all of it is freely accessible courtesy of the American government mostly. Another one is ENA, that stands for European Nucleotide Archive. And this is a mirror of GEO. Whenever you publish something on GEO, ENA just copies it, just to have another copy of it, just you know, as a backup. But it also has more than just GEO. One thing though is that there's no maintainers in the sense that they don't look at the metadata. They just copy it from GEO. But when you push something on ENA directly, you don't need to put some metadata. It could be anything you like. So it contains more data, but the metadata is not validated. So it's lower quality and it's sometimes harder to know what has been done to the sample because the metadata is not well maintained. Another one that I like is Entree Gene. Entree Gene is the gene database of the NCBI, which is the US Bioinformatics Institute. They provide gene name and models. So you go to a entry gene, you want to know what was the sequence of that particular gene in that organism. So you put your gene name there and then you see what happens. You also have the Ensemble database. So Ensemble is the gene database of the EBI, which is the European side of NCBI. So it's the European Bioinformatics Institute. They provide different gene names and different models. So why do I tell you this right now? It's just because it's horribly confusing. Am I just saying that for every gene you have two definitions of the genes, the European one and the American one? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. So you have to choose your side, either you're with the Americans or with the Europeans, and they're not exactly the same. Some would say the gene starts here. Some say, no, no, it starts there. One nucleotide before, or, you know, 100 nucleotides before, something like that. So there's no absolute agreement between where the genes are what they do, etc. You have the entry and CBI version and the ensemble version, and there are actually more versions, uh, but these are the, the two ones, basically. You have to choose, whenever you refer to a gene name, they would say, are you referring to the American gene or to the European gene? And that's true for literally every gene of every organism. And I'm saying you that right now so that you don't get confused a bit later on, imagining that 
there's only one repository for the genes on the planet. No, there are at least two, and there's more. Another one that I like a lot is Flybase. So Flybase is the genome database of Drosophila species. Flybase is nice because there's only one reference for all the flies, so that makes everything easy. There's only the Flybase reference numbers, and there's no like the American Flybase and the European Flybase. Flybase is American. The European never wanted to have a Flybase. So that makes everything simple. So if you work with fly genetics, everything's easy. If you work with human genetics or mouse genetics, everything is hard because you always have conflict between your colleagues using the other database uh, than the one that you're using. So there are really a lot of these databases. And I could spend a whole two hours explaining uh, so many things about other databases, but I have to stop here. The key points to remember for today's class is that Genomics creates very large data sets and databases, and that, of course, comes from high throughput sequencing. I hope you got the point now that we generate so much data that we, that also create needs to be able to query this data, to know what's inside. This, in turn, requires efficient algorithms, and the algorithms that were designed up until 2000 or even 2007, they were just not fast enough to cope with high throughput sequencing. It's just insanely lucky that Pretty much at the year when high throughput sequencing came was 2007, and the year where when uh, the FM index was kind of available for bioinformatics was 2009. We got just insanely lucky. Otherwise, we'd not be able to run bioinformatics or genomics nowadays if we didn't have these modern algorithms. And this, in turn, requires good standards. This is why we have these uh, three very important file formats, is so that these software can talk to each other and can store information efficiently so as not to waste resources. So we're now going to go into breakout rooms. I wanted to keep as much time as possible because you'll be today you'll, you'll need to fool around a little bit. And so I've got two questions for you. And the way you're going to answer them is by going on the internet and you know trying it out for yourself. And I'm not giving you much more information. You have the lecture of today to try and understand which tools you can use out there. So exercise one. What are these two proteins? Where do they map? So you got protein A, that's the sequence here. Protein B, B that's, that's the sequence here. So I'm asking you, what are they? In, in their genomes, where do they go? What's their coordinates? Exercise two, what are those genes? So gene A, gene B, and so that's C, T, C, A, 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 etc. So now, same question, like these are two genes, I'm just giving them to you and you got to figure out why did I just, what did I just give you? What are they? Uh, if they go to a genome, what are the coordinates of the genome that they go to? So I'm going to organize you in breakout groups now. I'm going to stop the recording. So if you're watching this offline, well, then I'm saying goodbye and, and um, see you next week after you.